So this is chapter three, section five. So let me, this is kind of a long lecture. I may actually decide to break it into two parts. But the basic overview in context of this lecture is that the graph of a function, and sometimes complicated function, allows us to visually glean information about that function. And before the advent of modern computers, so we don't have to go back that far, around 50 years, graphing had to be done by hand. And that was sometimes difficult, and the techniques developed in this chapter was to help graph functions by hand faster. Now today we have modern computers and modern computers can graph the most complicated of two-dimensional and three-dimensional functions, even four-dimensional functions if we look at the four-dimensional uh, space inside of a three-dimensional space actually that's projected on a two-dimensional screen. So the most important part of this particular lecture is really chalked up to mathematical reasoning. We're going to use reasoning techniques and deduce certain things about the graph of a function from um, knowledge of certain aspects of a function. So the functions we're going to be graphing this time are literally these types of functions. They're called rational functions. A rational function is a ratio of two polynomials. The only restriction is that the polynomial in the bottom, in the denominator, q of x in this case, is not the zero function. And remember, what is the zero function? If q of x is equal to zero for all x in the domain of q, then that's called the zero function. And clearly we can't have the zero function in the denominator of a fraction because division by zero is prohibited. So here are some examples. f of x is equal to 1 over x. f of x is equal to x plus 1 over 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. f of x is equal to 3x squared minus 3x minus 6 over x squared plus 8x plus 16. So notice that in each one of these examples I'm giving you, we have the function defined as the ratio of two polynomials. Notice that f of x equals 1 is the constant polynomial. So there's no problem with the first example. And clearly, if f of x is equal to x, then x is a very simple degree 1 polynomial. So let's do some reasoning based on these types of functions after we first identify just like we had identity functions, the squaring function, the absolute value function, <clears throat> the square root function, we have what is called the reciprocal function. So the reciprocal function is given by f of x is equal to 1 over x. So let's actually ask and answer or consider some questions. So all of these are mathematical reasoning and that's the reason we're going to go slow. So what is the domain of the reciprocal function? So how to find the domain of any rational function is to set the denominator equal to zero and solve for x. In this case, the denominator is literally x, and when, when we set x equals to zero, we find a value that has to be excluded from the domain. So the domain of this function is minus infinity 
all the way to zero, but we don't include zero. So this is an open interval. Open intervals don't include their endpoints, and of course minus infinity isn't a number to be included. And I'm going to take the union of zero to infinity. In other words, it's every real number except zero. Zero has to be excluded. So the domain is that right there. No reason to rewrite it. So let's ask another question. What is the range? So remember the range is the all possible values of f of x for for every x in the domain of f. So instead of looking at our x values, let me maybe choose this. So here I'm going to kind of just sketch a Cartesian coordinate system. And what we've already discovered is that the range of this function we haven't discovered anything about the range, that the domain of this function contains the entire x-axis except x equals zero, right there where the x and y axis intercept. So we're going to answer this question about the range by considering two other questions. And the first of those questions is what happens to f of x as the absolute value of x gets larger and larger and larger? And basically what we're asking here is let's just consider large values of x which can be positive or large negative values of x. What happens to the output of the function, which is f of x, is those values get really, really large, either really, really large in the positive direction or really, really large in the negative direction. And to encapsulate both of those, we just talk about the absolute value of x. So what happens to f of x as the absolute value of x gets larger and larger? That's going to be question one question. And the second question is very related. What happens to f of x as, again, we're going to deal with the absolute value of x, as the absolute value of x in this case gets closer to zero. Now, why are we care, do we care about, we know x cannot be zero. So I want to know what happens to f of x as x approaches this forbidden value. So let's actually look at the second question first. So let's give me some more space here. So remember our function is f of x is equal to 1 over x. Let's get some really, really easy values of x. I'm going to kind of make a table of values here. As x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, indeed, as x approaches 0. So I'll just do a few. This is a really, really simple question. And the trick here is to consider a specific type of an x. So 
So let's just start with x is equal to 1. <clears throat> so here's going to be my number line. Well, I just, I cannot do things today. So we're just going to pretend that this distance here, that's going to be my 0 value. And this is going to be my 1 value. So this is going to be 0. And this is going to be 1. So what I'm going to do next is divide that number line in half. So the next x value I'm going to consider is 1 half. And now I'm going to look at this and I'm going to divide it in 1 and half again. And that gives me x is equal to 1 fourth. Now notice I am getting closer and closer to 0 as I do this. So now I'm going to divide that into 1 half again, and that gives me 1 eighth. Now I'm going to divide 1 eighth into 1 half again, and that gives me 1 sixteenth. And this process continues on. Notice I'm s my approach to 0, I get closer and closer to 0 each time. But that approach slows down. So what is 1 divided by 1? Well, that's equal to 1. So what is 1 divided by 1 half? Well, we invert and multiply. That's the same as 1 times 2. So that's 2. What is 1 divided by 1 fourth? Well, we invert and multiply, and that's equal to 4. What is 1 divided by 1 eighth? Well, you guessed it. That's 8. This is 16. And this is 32. So we see as the absolute value of x, and it would be exactly the same if I did the negatives. If x is negative 1, then f of x is negative 1. But in absolute value, this is what we're going to have. So as, so that's the reason I just consider positive um, examples. So our observations here say as the absolute value of x gets closer and closer to this one particular element that is excluded from our domain, the value of f of x gets larger. And we say that it gets larger, that it approaches affinity. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and take the absolute value of the output. And it won't matter because the input is uh, positive numbers, so the output is positive. But sometimes they will take the absolute value as well. But here is the key. So as x gets closer and closer to 0, the y value on its graph gets larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. So now let's look at our second question. So these are general questions that we're going to ask for all of our graphs. And they're really important questions. So for the particular case, for the reciprocal function, so this is called the reciprocal, that it actually has a specific name. We know as f of x, I guess I could write as f of x, <coughs> no, I put What happens to is what I'm asking here. It's what happens. What happens? I could tell you a story about a German traveler I met in Belize who had the oddest English phrase. He never used it right. Instead of saying hello, 
he would say the S H I word happens. Happens. And he was supposed to be saying hello, and it was always the funniest thing in the world because he never understood the meaning of that term. So you can imagine how the native speakers always kind of laughed. So as, as, as the absolute value of x gets closer to zero than the absolute value of f of x goes to infinity. So that's the answer to number two when we talk about this particular function. And why did we choose zero? zero? Because zero is the one domain, one element from the real line that we excluded. As it's going to turn out, that's always going to be the case. Whenever we find a rational function and we exclude numbers from the domain, as the value of x approach those excluded numbers, then the value of f of x gets larger and larger, the absolute value of f of x. So let's ask this question. What happens to f of x as the absolute value of x gets larger? So let's go on down. So again, I'm just going to go slow in this and if the clock ticks too much, I will go ahead and break this into two uh, video lectures. So that's our reciprocal function. And now we're asking the question, what happens as the absolute value of x gets really, really large? So that symbolism right here is read as the absolute value of x approaches infinity. Then we want to know what happens to the absolute value of f of x. That's the question. So again, let's go ahead and make a table. And in general, uh, plotting functions by points don't want you really doing it. We'll do it here and there, and it is an important skill, but um, not something that we really care about, I care about so much that you do. I don't want you spending all of your time trying to do tons of arithmetic just to plot some points, because this is really about mathematical reasoning. So you, what am I going to do? I'm going to choose something similar to the values we had earlier. So I'm going to start x is equal to 1, then 2, I'm going to double it, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc. So I'm going to double. That grows really, really fast. There's a really interesting puzzle by a the king of Persia, the king of kings, that's, he, the king of kings was always known to be the king of Persia. The Greeks called him the Megaton Basilon. Well, he played chess with a peasant boy. And he says, if you beat me with chess, then I will give you a grain of rice and double it for every square on the chessboard. Well, the chessboard has 64 squares, and the peasant boy beat the, the king. Of course, this is just a story. So the king has to give him 1, then 2, then 4, then 8, then basically it's 2 to the 64 minus 1 grains of rice. So let's actually see how much this is. 2 to the 64. My goodness, and it doesn't make any difference if I subtract 1 from such a huge number. You know scientific notation. 1.8446744409 times 10 to the 19th. So it's 1. It's basically a 19-digit number, or maybe 20-digit number. Uh, that's an awful, awful lot. As a matter of fact, someone did the calculations. 
Uh, not all of the grain that existed on the entire earth could pay that debt. So let's figure out our values of f of x is x doubles each time. So 1 divided by 1 is, <laughs> I say 1 divided by 1 and I write 1 divided by 2. I have a hand that has a mind of its own. Now x is 2, so 1 half. x is 4, 1 fourth. Notice I'm getting smaller. Smaller still, smaller still, and smaller still. So as <clears throat> x gets larger, f of x approaches zero. So here's the question. Let's go back up. What is the range of the reciprocal function? Well, I know as x gets smaller and smaller and smaller and gets closer to zero, then 1 over x gets really, really large. It goes to infinity. On the other hand, as x, the absolute value of x, approaches infinity, then 1 over x approaches 0. So that suggests perhaps the range is minus infinity to infinity. But let's think for just a second. But is it? So what we need to check is can we have 1 over x ever cross the x-axis or touch the x-axis? So if f of x touches or crosses the x-axis, that means f of x, which is remember y, is equal to 0. Well, can we ever have 0 equal 1 divided by x? Is there any number in there? And remember x is in this domain. And the answer is no. So in other words, here it is. The only way, and this is truly the only way, a fraction can be zero is, I want you to think about this for a second, see if you can fill in that blank. So I hope you've thought about your answer, and here is the actual real answer, is when the denominator is zero. But our denominator is a constant. Hence, the range of this function we can now answer. The range of f of x is equal to 1 over x is literally minus infinity to 0. It never obtains 0. Union 0 to infinity. But be careful. The fact that the range of f of x is equal to 1 over x is the same as the domain is a pure coincidence this time. Usually that's not generally the case, it's just a coincidence. So let's actually take a look and see what the graph of the reciprocal function looks like. And right there it is. So you'll see, as if we look up here in quadrant one, as x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, approaching zero, suddenly 
the value of f of x gets larger and larger and larger. As x gets larger and larger and larger, the value of f of x approaches zero. Now down here, as the value of x gets to be a larger negative value, then the value of f of x becomes closer and closer and closer to zero, but it's on the negative side. And as the value of x approaches minus one, which is the same as the absolute value of one, then f of x gets larger and larger and larger, except in the negative direction. And we can see kind of the full, full picture right here. Really, no matter how far out I go, on, it looks like it's going to be touching. If I scooch in, I will see there's always space between the x-axis and my value of f of x. Notice how quickly it approaches zero. Here we have x is just 73.4 and y is less than zero, is less than two one hundredths. So two one hundredths is one over 50. So let's go back to our sheet. So those we answered two very important questions concerning the domain and the range of the reciprocal function. So I'm going to give you another example or another term here as asymptote. So let p of x and q of x be polynomial functions. So we're just going to consider a rational function and we're going to consider that p and x and q of x have been reduced to the lowest of terms. That means any common factors in the numerator or in the de denominator have been canceled out. And of course we always have to consider q of x is not the zero function. So the only thing we're, cons the only addition we've entered here is that p of x and q of x have been expressed in their lowest terms. <clears throat> so if f of x, if the absolute value of f of x goes to infinity, as x goes to a for some constant a, then the line x equals to a is a vertical asymptote. So we just had with the reciprocal function that when our function here was f of x is equal to 1 over x, then we found as x went to 0, and why 0? Because it's not in the domain, we found that the absolute value of f of x went to infinity. So the line x equals 0 is a, here we go, it's a vertical line, and in this case it's a vertical asymptote. That's a very Greek word. Very, very Greek word. It's a, it's not symmetric. I, I actually have tried to look this up. I took two years of, of classical Greek in grad school. Why? Because I wanted to. Literally because I wanted to. I was curious and I like languages. So, here is a very interesting question for you. What is the name? What is another name? For the vertical line whose equation is given by x is equal to zero. Can you answer that question? Think about it for just a second.
So if you answered the y-axis, then you got it right. And if that, if that surprises you, then go back and review, because that's really something important. Now here, so that was criteria one. Now let's do criteria two. Let's just look at it general, and then we'll come back to our friend, the reciprocal function, and apply it to that function. If for some constant b, we have that the absolute value of f of x approaches b, as x goes to infinity, then the line here, it's the horizontal line, y is equal to b, is a horizontal asymptote. So what did we discover? We discovered as x went to infinity, that the absolute value of f of x went to zero. Hence, the line y is equal to zero is a horizontal How you know it's Greek is because you see a PT together. That's about as Greek as you can get. And the E griega, for those who speak Spanish, that's the E griega, that's the Greek E. Um, so I'm going to ask another question. What is, what is another name? for the horizontal now line given by y equals 0. So if you answered the x, well, the x-axis, then you got it right. So here I've actually given you, uh, this is a GeoGebra, so I don't know what I'm doing right there, uh, but this, uh, that's probably not supposed to be there. You may not even see it, it's a little gray thing obscuring the numbers. I'm not sure why it's there, but this is, it's not part of the function. You can go to GeoGebra yourself, and you can just type in 1 over x and get what the function looks like. So that's the function. It's called the reciprocal function, f of x is equal to 1 over x. So now our objective <coughs> is to find domains, ranges, horizontal and vertical asymptotes, and intervals where the function is increasing and or decreasing. So let's look at this one. We'll, we'll do, this will be the only time that I do this, but we want to actually graph g of x is equal to minus 2 f of x. So here, literally, one of the reasons I don't want you to graph it is because, think, if f of x is equal to 1 over x, and then I consider a new function, m of x is equal to minus 1 over x. How are those two graphs related? Well, m of x is the reflection of f of x over which axis? Over the x axis. So that means if I know the basic shape of the reciprocal function, then I can pretty much kind of in my head or on paper reflect that shape over the x-axis to get m of x. Now let's define g of x is equal to minus 2 times 1 over x. 
which is the same as minus 2 over x. Note that 2 is greater than 1. So this represents a narrowing, vertical narrowing of the graph f of x. So to do the points, I'm, it's, it's really simple here. So what we want to do, we'll do maybe five points. And I'll take my x value. And then I'm just going to find f of x is equal to 1 over x, not 1 over 2, but 1 over x. And then g of x is equal to minus 2 over x. So basically, that's just minus 2 times f of x. So let's look at 1 fifth, 1 half. 1. Why? I can't put 0 in there because 0 is not in the domain of f of x, nor is it in the domain of g of x. 2 and 3. So if f of x is 1 over x and x is 1 fifth, then f of x is equal to 5 because 1 divided by 1 fifth is 5. If x is 1 half, then 1 divided by 1 half gives me 2. 1 divided by 1 gives me 1. 1 divided by 2 gives me 1 half. And 1 divided by 3 gives me 1 third. So this is just minus 2 times f of x. So minus 2 times 5 is minus 10. Minus 2 times 2 is minus 4. Minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. Minus 2 times 1 half is minus 1. Minus 2 times 1 third is minus 2 thirds. So we literally want to plot the points 1 fifth minus 10, 1 half minus 4, etc. Now I'm not going to plot them here. I'm going to go over to GeoGebra and I'm going to go ahead and turn this function off, kind of scooch in, and let's plot each one of these points. Uh, so that was 1 fifth and 5. No, minus 10, sorry. Minus 10. So right there it is. Let's do another one. The next one was 1 half and minus 4. The next one is 1 comma minus 2. And the next one is 2 comma minus 1. And then the next one is 3 comma minus 2 thirds. So you can kind of see exactly what's going on here. Now, of course, this isn't the, we're just looking at domain elements that are all positive. So when we actually look at the value uh, of minus 2 divided by x, we're going to, I want you to try to imagine we're going to have the same thing going on up here. And right there we go. That is the graph of minus 2 divided by x. So you can see there that we have the exact same horizontal asymptote at, <coughs> at y is equal to 0, in other words, the x-axis, and the vertical asymptote is the, exactly the same. It is the y-axis, or the equation x is equal to 0. Okay.
So let's look at this particular question. We're going to graph this. We're just going to think about it. So you're asked to graph g of x is equal to 1 over x plus 2 squared minus 1. So let's actually get everything we can get from it uh, by a asking some specific questions. So here is our function g of x is equal to 1 over x plus 2 squared and then I'm subtracting 1 from that. So let us find the first thing we're going to find is the domain of g of x. So to find it, so to find the domain of any rational function, any rational function, start with function, start with So this is important. Minus infinity to infinity. So that's going to be our start point. But we're going to modify it. Then set the denominator of the fraction part. Because notice here I have a fraction minus 1. So all we care about is that fractional part of the fractional part equal to 0. And solve for x. And then what do we do? Exclude. all x values from our start assumption of minus infinity to infinity. So let's actually do that. So we're going to set just the, the denominator. So we don't have to worry about the minus 1. The minus 1 is just a vertical shift down by one unit. So we're going to set x plus 2 squared is equal to 0. Well, that's the same as x plus 2 times x plus 2 is equal to 0. And the only time the product of two factors is equal to 0 is if at least one of the factors is equal to 0. In this case, b both of our factors are the same. So I just set x plus 2 equal to 0 and I solve for x. So x is equal to minus 2. So our domain is minus infinity to minus 2. And then I take the union of minus 2 and infinity. And here is another important point. From any excluded values of x, the line, the vertical line, x equals the excluded value, is a vertical asymptote. So I know that this graph has a vertical ax asymptote at x is equal to minus 2. So let's go over to GeoGebra for just a second. And I'm going to go ahead, what happens if I refresh it? Yeah, let's reload it. 
And <coughs> I'm going to do line x is equal to minus 2. So right there we go. So I know when I graph the function 1 over x plus 2 squared minus 1, that it's going to go to infinity as it approaches the line that I just graphed. So just to plot all of that down, this means the fact that we found an asymptote at x is equal to minus 2 means this means a lot of information. Like I said, this is the mathematical reasoning part. Um, that's the reason I'm going to use usually GeoGebra to graph rather than a table of values. Doing tables of values distracts us from what we need to be thinking about. This means as the absolute value of x approaches minus 2. Can you tell me what happens to the absolute value of f of x? It approaches infinity. Okay, so the, the domain of g of x is this. The domain of g is minus infinity to minus 2 union minus 2 to infinity. So that's the domain. What about the range? Well, for the range, let's consider any horizontal asymptote. But here we have to be careful about horizontal asymptotes. So I think it's going to be easier in this case to consider a similar type of function. f of x Why don't I just name the function that we're talking about? Is it f, f of x? No, it's g of x. Let's, let's consider f of x is equal to 1 over x squared. Then how do we transform that? Well, we would do a transformation. m of x is equal to 1 over x squared plus 2 squared does what? Well, we said x plus 2 equals to 0. We get x is equal to minus 2. So m of x is a horizontal shift to the left by 2 units. And then if I go to my g of x, now it's raining outside, is equal to 1 over x plus 2 squared minus 1. That's just a shift down by one unit of the graph of m of x. So let's ask the question, what happens as the absolute value of x goes to infinity, then the value of f of x goes to what? Well, we could do this really fast. Let's just plug in some obvious values. And you can see that whatever is true of f will be true of m of x, because m of x is just f shifted horizontally, minus 2 in the left direction. And g of x is just a shift down vertical. So again, using mathematical reasoning, x. And then we're just looking at 1 over x squared. So some easy values. We're just going to consider positive values of x. Let's do 1, 10, 100, 1,000. So 1 over x squared is 1. 1 over 10 is 1 over 10 squared is 100. And 1 over 100 squared is 1 over See what I'm doing here? I'm not trusting my memory. So it's 1 over 10,000. I got it right. And you can see what's happening. You don't even have to go another step. That is x 
goes, gets larger and larger, f of x goes to zero because each one of these numbers gets smaller and smaller. So that means that the equation y is equal to zero. So now we're in the horizontal is a horizontal So again, what do we do? We still have to ask a question. And this is important. I can't immediately say, well, this is my range. So this is the range that we have minus infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. Actually, that's going to turn out to be the answer. But as it turns out, we're going to learn some facts that we cannot always exclude the horizontal asymptote from our range. It is possible that the graph can cross some horizontal asymptotes. It just depends on where they're at. So at any rate, uh, we can ask the question, is f of x ever 0? No. Why? Because the only way this can be 0 is if the numerator is 0. But the numerator is 1, and that's never 0. So this indeed is our range. So let's take a quick look at 1 over x squared. Wow. So this is 1 over x squared. And notice that it has a vertical asymptote at the y-axis. Also notice that since x squared is always positive, and 1 is positive, then the y value is always positive. Yet another observation. Now let's do another one. 1 divided by x plus 2 squared. Ah, now we can see that by scooting it over that we've it's approaching our horizontal, sorry, our vertical asymptote at x is equal to minus 2. And the final thing we're going to do is going to be 1 over x plus 2 squared. And we're going to subtract 1 from it. So all of this red right here is going to dip down just a little bit. So there we go. We can see from the graph that if the horizontal asymptote, and that's what we actually discovered here, and I just made an error by doing the graph I just realized, I'm just looking at this. So this is really not the correct range. What is the range? What do I need to change here? I was just considering this function and its shift to the left, but we're literally looking at that function. So literally, this never gets equal to 0, but it gets close, and 0 minus 1 is minus 1. It gets really, really close to 0. So we change the range to minus 1. Sorry, I forgot that we had the minus 1 until I graphed it. Yeah, this is the one we're looking at, not f of x or m of x, but rather g of x. So again, we discovered for m of x that we got as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to 0. That's true of f of x and of m of x, that means 
that as x goes to infinity, then g of x, which is the correct function, which is equal to m of x minus 1, goes to 0 minus 1, which is equal to minus 1. Why? Because if, as, as x goes to infinity, g of x, which is equal to m of x minus 1, well, as x goes to infinity, m of x goes to 0, so m of x minus 1, which is g of x, goes to minus 1. What else are they asking us? So, what's the largest open interval over which g of x is increasing or decreasing? Also determine any vertical or horizontal asymptotes. We did that. So now let's just answer this question here. Uh, give the domain and the range. We have that. The largest open interval of which g of x is increasing or decreasing. So let's now go to our graph. And let's turn off everything except our actual function. So as we look, as we go from minus infinity to the line, I want that line there, x equals minus 2, my function is getting larger, my function value is getting greater and greater and greater. So from the interval, minus infinity to minus 2, the function is increasing. Now when we start from the interval minus 2, not including, and continue our onward journey, then as we go to the right, our function rapidly decreases and continues to decrease. So the final answer here is interval of increase, and by this I mean the largest interval, is minus infinity to minus, in, minus 2. And the largest interval of decrease is minus 2 to infinity. So that's an awful lot. So I am going to split this uh, up into two parts because on the next page we get a whole lot of information. So we will start at that information determining asymptotes and some information about the graph and notice that when we look at we, we're going to discover something not only do we have vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes, we're going to have slanted asymptotes. And in order to find those, we have to do polynomial division sometimes. So we'll do that in 3.5 part B.